Well, I was uh, um, uh, in a college uh, freshman. I had been, uh, in my own way, seeking very uh, intensively through my teen years. Atheist and was a kind of a fervent atheist, not a lukewarm atheist at all, <laughs> and uh, had become uh, uh, really desperate. And had uh, and actually, I decided I was going to, uh, if I couldn't find some answer to the problems of life within a two year period, I decided I'd kill myself. Wow. And uh, I was uh, just at that time. Suddenly, I heard about Buddha and Buddhism, <laughs> and uh, I, had, you know, I heard the name, but I was just a kid and knew nothing about uh, anything apart from America in the fifties and sixties. You know, it was like that. Yeah. And um, uh, when I heard about what Buddha said, I was, it was, um, I was overwhelmed actually. And my whole life changed right then and there. Um, what did he say exactly that overwhelmed you? Well, I was, you know, an atheist. I didn't believe in anything spiritual in that sense. But I had come to uh, I, what I was, uh, the decision I had come to was I have to find some way um, not to suffer so much. You know, uh -huh. um, that this the life is meaningless, life is hopeless without God, and there's no nothing can be done to redeem it. But uh, I just don't want to be miserable like this, and I had to find a real answer to it, not just some set of circumstances that made it better for the time being, but some actual solution to suffering. And um, Buddha speaks exactly to that. Um, I mean, uh, and he, uh, his, he gave a diagnosis of it. He said, life is suffering. That was the first Four Noble Truths. That was the first one. Right. And boy, was he right about that one. <laughs> you know, and it's not just that we're miserable all the time. It's a bit more basic than that. It's that everything is unsatisfactory in the end. Right. You know, even your happinesses don't really answer and then suffering returns, and then you get old and you get sick and die. Where is the fulfillingness in all of that? It's a very fundamental problem, not just superficially that I'm, you know, don't have a girlfriend and I'm 16 yeah. or <laughs> out of a job or whatever the heck it is. Right. It's more, although those things are there too, but more fundamentally, the human condition right. is always um, undermined by suffering that never seems to be dealt with in the end. Buddha said that, but then his second noble truth is suffering has a cause. The cause of suffering is thirst or desire, craving. And I had never thought that thought in my whole life. And it was amazing. It was obviously true. As long as you want things, you're going to suffer. And the only way, I mean, it's not, it's not an answer that we always want to hear, but it's the truth. <laughs> You have to annihilate desire if you want to annihilate suffering. And then the th third noble truth is annihilate suffering and annihilate desire. And the fourth noble truth is the Eightfold Path. I'm making this real quick. It's actually a much longer story than all of this. But I... Um, it, well, this is great stuff. Yeah. This is really good stuff. So yeah. my, my yes. whole... I mean, I was a kid. I was 17. But my whole... And you were at Harvard, right? This is before that, actually. This is out in high school. Okay. And um, my whole world was completely transformed overnight, I would say. Yeah. I, you know, I was just a kid. I didn't know anything. But Buddha was the first human being I had ever encountered who seemed to know anything. Again, I had never... My orbit of context was very limited. I had never really had Jesus in my life or anything else. But, but I felt this man knows. He knows the truth. And um, so I decided, okay, I'm going to become a Buddhist. But this was the 60s, so that didn't mean anything as jejun or as commonplace as 
um, joining the Buddhist order. It meant I would renounce the world, become a beggar, and seek nirvana. <laughs> and when it came to that, I was kind of scared of it because, uh, well, you know, what what do I do in the winter? It's cold. <laughs> I was up in, you know, in Boston area. I mean, the winters are terrible. And of course, you could always go to Florida. Wouldn't that kind of be cheating? The point is to overcome your selfish self-nature. So I said, okay, I'll give myself... Um, I had just gotten into Harvard. It was a big deal for my family. Everybody's a success story. They had no idea what was going on with me, in me. So I said, okay, I'll... Um, appease everybody. I'll go, I'll go to college for one year, and at the end of my first year, I'll break the bad news to them all, drop out, and become a Buddhist beggar, and seek your And in the meantime, I'd sort of train myself and prepare my life fast and get used to... Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't really see how it was possible to overcome, you know, your desire nature. It actually... <laughs> I read about what Buddha had to do it, and I just think, man, I just don't have what it takes. But anyway, <laughs> well, I, you know, I found this was the truth, and I had to try to do it. So, um, um, actually, that my parents were what didn't know what on earth was going on with me. So they um, did a big driving tour of the western half of America that year, and they dragged me along. I didn't want to go at all. And uh, so we would, but I wound up falling in love with the West of America. It's very beautiful, the mountains and the plains. And so um, after we would go camping each night, and I would then after we set the camp, camp, I would go out in the woods. Because I was a Buddhist, I was going to meditate. I didn't actually know the first darn thing about Buddhism, really speaking. But I knew meditate. So I would get in the lotus position, and the mosquitoes would bother me. Thinking, this isn't very promising. I can't deal with a few mosquitoes. But um, but then I started. But this is the meditation I did. It's actually a very good meditation. I would imagine I was sitting there, and the Buddha was um, sitting about um, five feet away from me. And I would look at him and he would look at me. And that was the meditation. I don't know how I thought of this, but it's actually a good meditation to do. So uh, I would do this every night for a while. And um, then during the day, I started to notice something. Um, I don't know if you've ever you've been in a room of people and suddenly... You know, I'll have this, and somebody's looking at me, and I'll look, and somebody is looking at me. You know that feeling? Mm -hmm. It's almost like somebody's touching your face or something. Yeah. Well, I would have the feeling somebody's looking at me, and I would lose it. And then I would remember um, meditating on Buddha, mm -hmm. and um, look at him, and it was like Buddha was looking at me. Oh. And it was the strangest feeling I'd ever had in my whole life, because I didn't actually believe that anybody like Buddha could exist anymore. I was still an atheist. I was the most, you know, I was just a ridiculous excuse for a Buddhist. <laughs> but, and I didn't believe in anything transcendental. I just thought you annihilate yourself, you annihilate your false self, and you enter into a bliss state. And you know, what happened then was kind of vague. But um, I didn't actually believe that there could be anyone like a Buddha now. But it was such a powerful feeling that I got. And I remembered I read something. It was um, uh, a book about the early disciples of Buddha. And, uh, you know, Anand, he's the, the uh, Peter, the Ali Erich of that time. And uh, Anand, after Buddha died, said, Buddha is still here. You can talk to him, you can pray, you can call to him. And the scholar who wrote the book said, well, Anand loved Buddha, but he didn't really understand his teaching. Buddha's not there. He's not a deity. He's nothing like that. And when I read it at the time, I thought, yeah, the scholar's right. Anand didn't really understand Buddha. But then I was having this experience of uh, feeling that you know, Buddha was looking at me, and I was thinking, well, who really knew Buddha better? You know, the scholar who wrote the book, or Anand? Well, well, Anand did. And 
they would say about nirvana, it's beyond time and beyond space. And I would say that, yeah, beyond time and space, but sort of a platitude. What if it's really true? What would something beyond time and space look like to somebody like me? It would look within time and space as the face of Buddha looking at me. That's how I would understand that. So maybe this really is happening. Maybe this is really true. And maybe there's a lot more to this whole reality than I imagine. Anyway, I would really think about this a lot. I, would, I was always interested in these sorts of things. So then I got back home and went to started going to college, and I was going to drop out at the end of the year and become a beggar and all that kind of thing. <laughs> and then it was, um, I remember the date, it was November 22nd. Um, my roommate and I, um, uh, he actually had been my friend in high school, and we would talk about all these things. It was a Friday afternoon, and I just bought uh, the Rolling Stone magazine, you know, the Rolling Stone, ah. and I had it under my arm. I had oh, looked at that it. wonderful. Yeah. And I was going back to my room with my roommate, and my roommate pointed to a poster on the wall and said, Oh, that's Meher Baba. He says that he's the Buddha. Ah. And I immediately <laughs> <laughs> Because I knew that a Buddha had said he would come back as the Maitreya Buddha. Mm. And I had been thinking, this is the sort of time, the sort of age where that would happen. So immediately I knew this, the most important thing in the world is for me to find out, is this true? So I looked at it, but it, it was a, just a, I, you, I'm sure you know the photo, it was like a 1965 passport photo, just a mugshot of Baba. And I had somehow been expecting somebody young or something. And so it was a little bit surprising. But um, also I sort of imagined Buddha as somebody more remote. Or, and whereas Baba's face is very kind of right here and kind of ordinary in a way, you know, I mean, sort of like keep relating to ordinary people. So, uh, I don't know, it was a little bit surprised. And it was about a lecture that night by Alan Cohen. So this is Harvard, right? All right. It was on LSD, <laughs> Consciousness, and Mayor Baba. Now, Harvard was the very place where the experimentation in LSD began. And uh, Alan Cohen, as I then later found out, had been on that original group with uh, Tim Leary and uh, Richard Alpert at Harvard, experimenting with LSD. So that was a topic calculated to draw the crowds, which in fact it did, as it turned out. And it was, um, so I saw this poster and I thought I was going to go. Of it was LSD and what? I think it was some, LSD, Consciousness, and Mayher Baba. Oh, it was something like that. A talk by Alan Cohen, mm -hmm. some such thing. And uh, so my roommate and I were both going to go. So then when I went up to my room and I opened up the Rolling Stone, and the cover story was on Mayher Baba. <laughs> and it was uh, by Pete Townsend getting, I forget what the title was. And uh, it was kind of a coincidence, but at the time it seemed uh, sort of natural. And so I read the story, of course, and uh, he starts quoting from Baba's message, The Highest of the High. And uh, um, Baba says, I'm not a Satpurush or a Wali or a Pir or a Mahatma, these various things. And then, I am the Ancient One, the Highest of the High. And when I read that, it was like somebody rang a bell inside of me that I hadn't even known was there. Mm. And I felt, this is the voice of the Buddha. Mm. No one else could have said this. Mm. And um, so then that night I went to the talk, and there were about a thousand people. It was a really wow. huge talk. One of the huge, one of the large auditoriums at Harvard was packed. Still 1122? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Master numbers. And it was actually the anniversary of Baba's visit to the Boston area. Yeah. Yeah. Powerful date. Yeah. And so downstairs, uh, there's a downstairs and balcony, and it was all full. And um, Alan is very good with that kind. I mean, the Harvard audience is, uh, uh, when you're talking with something like a spiritual master, you, you, okay, in those days, people were more receptive to it, but there are a lot of skeptics who come to anything like this. But um, Alan really knew how to talk to them 
And um, he uh, said that Meher Baba said that he was God. And that was a real shock because I had, you know, didn't believe in the existence of God. But I knew that anything Meher Baba said was true. Mm. And if he said he was God, well then, God existed. And that was actually the answer to the question. That question. No, why me. did you know it at, at this point? I first. just was certain that he was. When, when, when I read that thing in the highest of the high, I'm the ancient one, the highest of the high. In, in the peak oh, house of the yeah. Okay. I mean, it was all blurred together. I was uh-huh. coming. But I just knew. It's that omniscience. It's just knowing. It's yeah. knowing. Yeah. It was just, it's just there. I just, it's just a certainty. It yeah. was just there. Yeah. And I, would, I will say that feeling of certainty has never left me since that time. Mm-hmm. There's never been any. All right, do, you know, doubts, thoughts, stupid thoughts flow through, flow mm-hmm. through, but there's never been any doubt for me since that day. And uh, so, but it, I mean, Baba said he was God. I mean, like infinite power, infinite knowledge, infinite bliss. He could do miracles, all this stuff. It was a real surprise to me to know that that element was there in the universe. And uh, so, when the talk was over. Um, a lot of people were asking questions of Alan Cohen. I didn't even have any questions. I, but I was sort of standing in the line. I wanted to have a question just because I wanted more. <laughs> finally, everybody was gone, and Alan looked at me. I couldn't think of one question to ask. You'd think, like, do you have a mailing list? Do you have a meeting? I mean, I just wanted to keep the conversation going, but I couldn't think of anything at all. Mm. When I think about it, it's the most ridiculous thing in the world because Harvard teaches you to be skeptical of everything, and most particularly skeptical of things like this. And yet, I couldn't bring up one question into my mind. So I just went back to my room. I did so I did never got in touch with anyone for a couple months because I hadn't thought to ask if they had a mailing list or anything. And I went to my room and I had this little place I would do the meditation in. And when I was sitting there, I knew that I had the purpose of my life had been revealed to me, and I was born to follow and serve me here long. Mm-hmm. And there's never been any question at all since that day. So it was a zap, a one, a six hour zap. Mm. So that's how it came to Baba. <laughs> Thank you. To me, God speaks is like your head, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And the story you just told is your feet, uh-huh. where you started. Yeah. It helps me. I think there are a lot of people who are helped mm-hmm. by knowing how unique. Well, there is. is people come to Baba. It's no big esoteric truth suddenly there. It's yeah. yeah. Eric used to uh, encourage us to tell our stories of how we came to Baba, yeah. actually. Yeah. And there does seem so often to be something, there's the mark of his touches there in his own, how he actually reawakens his link with his lovers. Mm-hmm. You know, it, we don't actually do it. It's actually Baba seeking us and finding us out and pulling us to him. And with a sense of humor. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Which your story has been full of. <laughs> well, that was, that completely changed everything for me, of course. So within a couple, within two months, I went to the center and met uh, Katie Elizabeth. And within a year and a half, came here to India. And so met all the Mandalay. That was seventy-two, and there were quite a few people here. So my whole life has been completely centered around Mayor Baba ever since that time. Mm. So that's my Baba story. Thank you. Thank you. So what? 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 Uh, in all of this for all these mm. years, what did you do before you moved here? When did you move here? What year? <clears throat> I moved here in 1993. I remember that. Mm-hmm. We were in a car yeah. yeah, that's right, up in Oregon area. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wound up getting, um, uh, of course, my college degree and then a master's and PhD in uh, medieval literature. I'd want, and I became a professor of Old English, uh, Anglo Saxon. 
and I specialized in Old English and in uh, also Greek, Homeric Greek. You, you got a master's in what, sorry? Um, master's and PhD running together in uh, medieval studies. Both medieval, the same. Okay. Yeah. Medieval English, which means Old English and Middle English. Old English is like Beowulf. And Middle English, the like Chaucer or Seguin and Green Knight. And uh, so I became a professor of that field. It turns out to have been a really good um, specialization for the work that I do now. Because when you're dealing with medieval literature, you have to know a wide range of philosophy, theology, all that sort of thing. And also linguistics and language mm -hmm. is central to it. And also um, dealing with manuscripts because uh, the medieval texts are all based on old manuscripts. So you get a certain amount of training uh, just as part of your uh, basic graduate work. Also, it so happened that the uh, professor who was my mentor, who I worked under, he just died about two or three years ago, but um, he was uh, widely regarded as the world's leading scholar in um, comparative oral tradition. Now, what that means is uh, studying, uh, for example, Homer as an oral poet. At least that was the uh, view held by this school of uh, scholarship, where he didn't write but had cultivated an art of improvisation. Mm -hmm. Sort of like um, in Indian classical music, you know, they don't actually have a musical score, but it's not, it's a highly developed art form. It's not as though they're just kind of winging it. You've heard rods on, uh, you know, Ravi Shankar, or, uh, like that. So that uh, oral poetry would be composed in that way. And so I was uh, quite um, versed in that. I wrote a lot of articles, and I had a book dealing with these things. And it turns out to be quite pertinent to the situation uh, of Baba's discoursing. Because he too, he actually wasn't speaking, it wasn't oral in that sense. But his, um, like the discourses I'm working on right now, chicken lectures, these were live. And they, they weren't, it's not like Baba wrote out a script and then went out and read it to the mandala. Mm -hmm. No, he was uh, communicating uh, extemporaneously to them. And uh, what got written down was a register of what he had said. So that was exactly the, uh, the, thing, the topic in which I became a specialist. I also had another major professor, Walter Ong was his name, who was, again, one of the leading scholars in the whole world in exactly this subject. So it turns out that the uh, branches of scholarship that I got a training in were wonderfully uh, preparatory for the work that I'm doing now, in Bible's words. And now we're, we're working with records of dictations that he gave and uh, trying to reconstruct uh, what he said. So that was the very kind of thing which I uh, studied as a mm. professor. Can you see that that was all part of the plan? Well, it looks like it. It looks like it to me. Not that you knew it. No, I didn't at the time. But it was known. Upstairs. Yeah, I very much felt. When I came here in 1993, actually Bao uh, invited me to come. So I just left my job. It was kind of a reckless move. I had just gotten tenure. I had just, you know, with tenure you have a lifetime job. So it was like throwing away a lifetime security wow. job. And I had just had a book published by Princeton University Press, which is one of the leading presses in the whole world, academic presses. So I really had a of academic career. My you know, mentor was the leader and uh, was a superstar. Two of both of them were superstars, so I had a real um, you know, golden road ahead of me. But um, I never wanted it. You know? I never liked it. I just wanted to live for Baba. I was just doing this because I had to do something in the world. So when uh, Bao asked me to come, I felt like Baba was saying to me, all right, Ward, you've been complaining all these years how you want to be, <laughs> you know, working for me and not for the world. Well, 
Are you coming or aren't you? Oh. <laughs> so I and I did, I had very little savings at that time, so I had to live here like a church mouse for the first fifteen <laughs> years, as others have done. You know, like hundred bucks a month or hundred and fifty bucks a month, <laughs> watching every penny. Um, and uh, but you know the funny thing is, even though my parents were very upset, as oh good, you can. <laughs> I mean, from every point of view. Every worldly point of view, they were completely right. It was a ridiculous thing to do because I would never get a job like that again. Mm. You know, the, the, these kinds of jobs are real impossible. Yeah, actually, when I've been applying for jobs, you know, in English literature, getting jobs is really good jobs is really impossible. impossible. <laughs> and um, as if that wasn't bad enough already, having a specialization in old English. It's not as though you put out your resume and wait for the offers to come flying in. I mean, they're just, in a whole year, there might not be one position that specialized in that. So what did I, your department think when you had to resign? Um, what did you say to them? I just kind of, you know, from uh, Lord of the Rings, El Bilbo, just put on a ring and disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I did. What did you do? I just um, told them I was leaving and never gave an explanation and I was gone. So the people mm. in my world don't, couldn't figure out what on earth had happened. I didn't know what, to, what was I supposed to say. I rode a bus with you to Marisad one time mm. only. I remember only one sentence you said mm. and it was that you couldn't see any reason to study literature if it wasn't about God, period. Yeah, you know, that's really what I felt. That's how I've known more Park since. I mean, I was doing it because I had to do something, and it's what I was fitted to do. And, uh, and then your also, also, when I was in graduate school, I actually hated academia. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I mean, I hate that the, the perverted intellect right now is so sick. I really kind of love not not the literature itself. I like, like Homer is fantastic. The literature is wonderful, but the way that intellectuals have gone with it right now is maybe that's a whole subject that found it revolting. Thing. So it was really torture to be in that world. But when I was applying for jobs, I couldn't get any kind of a decent job, any job, even terrible jobs. <laughs> and uh, then I got a. Um, on campus interview at LSU. This is actually a plum of a job. It was a research institution. It would be a research position. You know, these are. And I was not getting terrible jobs. And uh, the last day of the on campus interview, usually you go back home and in two or three weeks they tell you yes or no. But I was, I was going to get on the plane. The chairman of the department said, we want, we want to let you know we're offering you this position. Oh. And you know what day it was? January 31st. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. So it was like, it was seemed to me like a clear sign from Baba. You'd have to be brain dead not to yeah. be that right. So I felt Baba gave me that job. Mm. I was not getting awful jobs, the sorts of jobs that I'd been offered. I would have said yes and then gone shot myself. You know, those kinds of jobs. <laughs> So it wound up giving me a, a, a real training in all the things that I do now. I didn't, anyway, I didn't need any really to learn more about spirituality or God or theology. I mean, those things I can find it on my own, but I needed to know about linguistics, manuscripts, working with you know, sort of a intercultural environment, because actually Baba was doing that too. You know, he was um, under the British Raj, a foreign, uh, you know, imperial overlord to his country. He was himself from Iran, uh, had uh, Farsi, Persian in his own background. He was a Zoroastrian in a Hindu, uh, Muslim country like that. So it was this big cultural mix that he was involved in. And actually, medieval literature was very much like that in many ways. Because uh, at least what I was working with, there was an interaction between these different um, societies and different literatures. So it was really an excellent training. I had no idea. And when I first came here, I wasn't doing anything like this. I was um, a secretary, as 
others here have been. So I was um, taking dictation and compiling lists and addresses. And what out. exactly did Bounty say to you to offer you to come and work here? What, what, what kind of job did he offer you? To come and work just with him or you had no clue what you'd be doing? Or? I was working with him. Uh, John Connor had been his personal secretary yeah. for 10 years or more. And John left. He's married Barbara. And I wasn't there at the time. <laughs> but um, I, the, I, I think it was through the Pearsons that I heard, Christy Pearson, that Val was uh, I had two people, myself and Freeman. And uh, it was, I, I had brought this up with the Mondelez several times, how I wanted to live there and um, be my resident. But it actually wasn't practical from my point of view either. One thing is I had... I only had, you know, an assistant professor doesn't get much salary, and so I had no savings to speak of. I think when I came here, I had maybe $20,000, and that was to last me for the rest of my life, as far as I knew. <laughs> so, and I was leaving a job, and, you know, if I decided I wanted to go back again, I could wave my resume. Old English scholar looking for a job. <laughs> <laughs> and wait for the offers to compete with each other. Um, you know, it, it, there was, I don't know what I would have done if I had to go back. But, um, so, uh, I just, uh, yeah, when Bao asked, I just, uh, left it. So I just put on my magic ring and vanished. And <laughs> so I was, uh, for about four or five years, was engaged in, um, <coughs> You know, letters and dictation, and then Bob became the chairman in the '96, and so there was a lot of secretarial work to do. And then in 1998, all of us '97, all of a sudden, this um, cache of manuscripts um, uh, came into light. Mm-hmm. Marwan Jessawala was the one who knew about them. Eric, of course, and finally Eric said, Did you say that I became chairman in 1998? 96. Six. 96, okay. when Lottie died. Okay. And um, he was, of course, going to the States every year doing world tours. And uh, uh, then Marwan had uh, been in conversation with his brother Eric. Uh, about this group of manuscripts that had been found shortly after Baba dropped the body. And really, they were, had been kept very much secret. No one knew about them. Even Baba didn't know about them. And um, then in 1997, at the end of one of our publication committee meetings, um, we've been dealing with regular matters. I think the publication committee had just been created the year before. And uh, Marilyn so we're just about to end it. And said, oh, I have one, before we break up, I wanted to mention something. And he brought up infinite intelligence and these manuscripts, which, I mean, it was a total blockbuster. None of us had the slightest idea that there was anything like this in the picture. And uh, uh, Bao was in um, um, America at the time, but he was really thrilled by the news when he heard. So when I... Came back that from, time you, you were not working with Val? He, he had just left for America, so I yeah, was Yeah, but still you didn't him. travel with him? No, I was back in uh, the post office. Okay, but you were still part of his team? I'm just trying to figure out the chronology. Yeah, there wasn't okay. a, a team to the extent there is now. There's you and Freeman. Freeman. And Freeman. And Freeman would go with Val on the tours to America. And I'd stay back here. And I would go to America a little bit later, in June to August, and stay with my parents. So when I came back from uh, America, Bao was all ready to go on infinite intelligence. And actually, even though he was chairman, he completely closed his eyes every day from 9 to 2. And all he did was infinite intelligence. So ever since then, I had no idea that I would be working on scholarly stuff again, which is what this is. In fact, my first four years here, that scholarly you know, world seemed like another lifetime. Mm-hmm. Just, I just thought, well, that, you know, is gone. I was glad for it to be gone, actually. I, the uh, scholarly world itself, I really disliked. And uh, 
that was completely out of my picture and all of a sudden it came back again without any warning at all. And so uh, ever since then, that's been my work. Um, completely immersed in uh, these records of Baba's discourses. It's been mostly the 1920s, although there have been other things that have come to. We did a, an edition of the discourses, the revised sixth edition of the discourses, and other things like that have come up. But the main work has been Baba's, uh, we could call it early dispensation from Baba, uh, material from the 1920s that had just gotten completely buried. Uh, really, until 1997, there was just this stash of stuff that nobody had looked at for yeah. 50 years. I don't think anybody knew that this was there. It was a different age back then. I mean, the Mondelēji weren't interested in old manuscripts. You know, they that that wasn't their role. Um, they were they lived with Baba. They had the living avatar, and they were sharing him with people who came. That was what they had to do. Um, but we're in a different age now. I mean, the people who actually live their lives with the Avatar, uh, almost all of them are gone now. So, so you hated when you were at the university in the scholarly world, but you, now you're in a different university. Yeah. You have <laughs> university, and now you have a different, whole different outlook huh? oh, in yeah. the scholarly world. It's not the research and literary stuff that I minded. It was the perverted intellect of the academia that I couldn't stand. But working in, with Baba's material, there's none of that. This is the truth. The beautiful truth that the Avatar has revealed. How do you explain God Speaks when you speak about God Speaks? Or do you have different versions for different parts mm. of the community? Yeah. Uh -huh. How do you explain? Well, I'm trying to get the exact question. And how do you explain why? Well, God speaks is a thick book with a lot of yeah. information mm -hmm. in it, and you don't. You have to have. So I would imagine. But Boyd is mostly involved in infinite intelligence and the Tiffin diaries. Well, I've worked a lot with God speaks oh, too. Not time. not doing editions, but a lot of seminars and stuff. And it actually I didn't get your question. I'm sorry. I'm how does he present? Present. Okay. Um, okay. Such a okay. to me complex. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Expression on it. <laughs> it actually uh, God speaks and infinite intelligence. I would say are the two books we have from Mayor Baba that are closest to each other in a way, that they're really, it's an, a wretched word, but philosophical. We don't have a good English word for what Baba's giving. It's not philosophy in the ordinary way. Right? But um, for Baba is explaining God and creation. The discourses do that also. They're, they're a real masterpiece. But the discourses um, uh, have a very different purpose and audience in view. They're not meant, intended to explain high philosophy for its own sake. They're really intended for the seeker of God to give you the understanding that you need on various topics to live a life for God. And in the course of doing that, the discourses give wonderful stuff. I mean, they're, they're really, really magnificent. But uh, if God speaks is not that way. God speaks really is kind of high philosophy, and, and Baba directly takes on the matter of ultimate truth. And, um, you know, since um, Infinite Intelligence came up in 1997, one of the things I've done a lot is, um, my, on my own time, or uh, sort of my light reading before I go to bed, <laughs> will be something like Shankaracharya's Brahma Sutra Vasya. I actually enjoy those things. And, um, so I've been reading. I didn't in, have any idea how to spell that. Brahma Sutra Vasya. It's um, Brahma Sutra Vasya. B H A S Y A. It's oh, I just logged off. Oops, my hands are getting wet. Sorry. It's. Uh, widely regarded as the greatest work of Indian philosophy. Do we need to pause or?